Day one in the books. We were finally able to see the new quarterback in the new threads. We saw a lot of things. One of the biggest things that impressed us all was Foster Moreau being out there. We're going to hear from Carr. We're going to hear from Moreau. And of course, you better stick around because we bring in a very special guest to the show. We are excited to hear from Marcus Colston. He takes a deep dive into him as the wide receiver back when he played. Brings us into the mindset of some of the wide receivers that are currently on the team. And there's a little bit of a A.T. Perry comparison you're going to want to hear. Yeah, I was thrilled to get him on here. I've been yeah. trying to get him on the podcast for three years. We hire Brooke. We get Marcus. It's just kind of Don't how give it me goes. That much credit. So second biggest <laughs> get this year after you, but it's still a big get. We are coming to you from the Better Call Bado podcast studio, and we are presented by PJ's Coffee. Go check out PJ's. We start every single morning with them. They have locations all over the city, the best coffee that you can possibly get. And if you need legal help with any of the following, check out Better Call Bado. They sponsor our podcast studio, and they will help you with car wrecks, offshore injuries, 18-wheeler collisions, Maritime and Jones Act, hurricane and storm claims. You better call Bado at 504-323-7777 or 985-303-7777 for your free consultation and case review and we are also sponsored by hard hide punch a tool strawberry whiskey look for the red bottle everywhere you go that is an 86 proof blend of aged wheat bourbon american light whiskey and fresh punch a tool strawberries blended in new orleans it is not for the thin skin look for it in your favorite stores bars and restaurants and we are also sponsored by ideal market and if you are looking to get some stuff for this memorial deep this memorial weekend go check them out they have everything there all your grilling needs they have their freshest and most delicious meats to throw on your grill and charcoal a huge selection of domestic and imported beers and everything to make the memorial day weekend memorable and while you're out and about go check out firehouse subs veteran boulevard location great people doing great things for the city let's get into the show to mention the heat and humidity right nick that's your favorite part to talk about i'm just kidding there was no there was actually no it was bad it was nice it was probably the nicest practice i've been to weather wise otas usually aren't that bad not that bad no there really wasn't any humidity which was really nice so sorry to the guys that maybe thought that this is what it was going to be like Yeah, training camp will hit everyone like a punch in the face yeah it was you know what (laughs) you know what it was a welcome for the new quarterback Derek carr was out there in the new threads I know how I feel, but I'm going to let you guys go first. We have to talk about the quarterback first. What did you like and what did you see from Derek Carr? Well, yeah, I mean, he looks like a pro. We expected him to look like a pro. Um, He talked so much afterward about how much he's still learning the terminology, Mm -hmm. the confusion about uh, uh, he thought a player was going to come into his huddle. Oh, no, I got to go over and get it from Pete. Uh, This play for nine years was called this, and now now it's actually this. Uh, a backup center hitter, you know, like he talked about all the little adjustments he was making, but that, that didn't really show on the field uh, as Nick charted uh, eight for eight and, and uh, completing his passes in competitive situations. The thing that stood out to me is almost all of them were to tight ends, a couple Chris Olave mixed in, uh, but that connection and, and even when they were doing routes on air, that connection with Jawan Johnson mm. stood out to me quickly. And then Lucas Kroll got in the mix quite a bit too, but uh um, and talk to both Carr and Jawan Johnson about that afterward, too. Uh, I'm high on that connections potential. Yeah, I thought he looked good. It, it was a good first step. It's one practice. But he looked natural out there. He looked like a quarterback. He threw the ball well. He moved well. Eight for eight, as you said. The only one pass was one you pointed out. I'll let you uh, tell the story <laughs> on that one. But I, I thought he looked I thought he looked really good overall, and I think it's going to keep building. It's going to keep getting better. They're just kind of in their base install right now. So you see the base defense, you see the base offense. So it it is kind of basic. The fact that the tight ends are so involved in that is just simply also a result of not having a wide receiver on the inside. Lucas Kroll was the star of the day. As we (laughs) predicted, it was going to be somebody who was with the team last year coming back and knows what they're doing (laughs) against guys that don't know what they're doing. But overall, I thought it was a really good day for the offense. Yeah, you mentioned the best play of the day. It wasn't the best throw of the day. Let's be clear on that. He definitely lobbed it up. And he even mentioned it kind of in whenever we got done with training camp about he wanted to see Chris Olave go up and win a ball. And that's what he did. He lobbed it up. Marcus May in coverage and Chris Olave made a phenomenal catch. But 
Another thing we learned about Derek Carr, he's kind of a king of the one-liners. Today felt like day one, had a young center, you know, hit, hit my pinky. Everybody's been so friendly. Um, that's until I, you know, throw an incompletion. Today I was like, hey, I'm coming to you on this. You know, I need you to win. And he's like, how much time do I have? I said, I don't care, just win. Also watching your big brother get sacked a million times, you know, makes you want to be in control of things too. I've been walking around my house. My, my little daughter knows our, you know, snap count. You know, she's been saying it back to me because I've been yelling it through the house as I'm calling plays and doing things. He used to throw into someone in a gold helmet, you know. Um, you know, I did last year one time, um, but hopefully not too many more times. Carr even mentioning, you know, that crazy Olave catch. I think that's going to be a connection that we continue to see in the black and gold. Well, what was so big about that, and not only was it the obvious highlight of the day because it was a deep ball that resulted in a touchdown, but I was actually standing right next to Nick at the time. And we both made like almost the same comment. Like, well, that's new. Like that is specifically what we've talked about with Chris Olave heading into the offseason, what he talked about a lot, what Dennis Allen has talked about. The one element of his game that he wanted to improve on was getting stronger, mm -hmm. winning contested catches, going up and winning a fight and coming down with the ball and holding on to it. And it's just funny that and, and Derek Carr must have been aware of that since he yeah. said he wanted to give him that uh, opportunity to go and get one because he said, this is the time of year when you work on this. So he didn't care if he threw an interception. But that was huge, and that that you know, if if those two are going to build that kind of chemistry, um, um, that's that's the duo to watch. Yeah, for me, the best thing I heard about that wasn't from the media. It was walking over to Tyron Matthews' locker, and he goes, "Yeah, I saw it. I like that. I don't think they're going to get any more gimme catches, though. I think that put the entire secondary on notice. And for somebody like Marcus May, I mean, he's going to remember that. I would think, right, Nick? Yeah, I mean, look. <laughs> But this is huge for Olave. This is yeah. the, the the aspect of his game that he has to build. You need to see it. He mm -hmm. worked on it all offseason. He talked about how he was going to go work out and get bigger and stronger. And it was it was a reflection that he knew at the end of last season. And his contested catches last year were like twelve for the whole entire season. We saw way too many passes where he would get his hands on a ball like that and come to the ground and lose it. So just the fact that he could complete a play, it's a good first step. It's not by any means <laughs> uh, a sign that this problem is completely solved. But it's a step in the right direction. It was tight end day. That's actually a quote from Foster Moreau. When we saw him out on the practice field, he kept yelling, tight end day, tight end day, because <laughs> they started out in that very like high volume uh, tight end offense. And for me, the biggest surprise was seeing that Foster Moreau was not only healthy, but was able to participate in all of the drills. It's crazy. It's the most <laughs> unbelievable yeah. thing ever that he's out there and that he's, he's actually doing stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I just... It's kind of hard to get your head around it. I think he's an important piece to the team, but the fact that he's healthy, like away from football, Crazy. sort of, I, I don't even know where that's at. Is he still going through any treatments? Like he's not. So, you know, he said in his interviews that treatments actually ended the day before he signed. And if this were to come up though, he did mention, you know, if he has to continue treatments, like this is a battle he's going to have to fight for the rest of his life. And he was yeah. very open and honest about that, which for somebody who is as young as he is and having to get your head around that and still wanting to play in the NFL, Derek Carr said it perfectly. It's miraculous that yes. he was out on the practice yeah. field. Unbelievable story. And Mike, for you, what did you, at least from a football perspective, if you take away kind of what he's dealing with personally, did you like what you saw from Foster? Yeah. I mean, one of the very first uh, uh, catches of the day was, was to him. And then Carr said afterward, look, I don't have to get you. He's one of the guys I don't, I don't have to get used to throwing the ball to Foster Moreau. I mean, look, we, we, we said it for so many reasons. It was the biggest hole in the lineup, and they filled it with a guy who fits exactly what they were looking for uh, and has that connection with Carr. And then we saw the connection on display, like three snaps into them doing rounds on air with each other. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he again, we're not overhyping anything mm -hmm. we saw, but it, it it's just a real comfortable connection between those two. Absolutely. And comfortable for him. He mentioned, you know, being comfortable driving around town. He's definitely somebody that doesn't have to use the GPS, played at Jesuit, played at LSU. He's a New Orleans native. And he also brought us in a little bit, too, on what he's been dealing with and put it in his own words, his entire treatment and also how this cancer came to be. Right. I'm just sitting there with Dr. John Amos and he just starts to describe to me the different symptoms that I'm showing. Um, obviously that primary symptom of having an enlarged lymph node in my left clavicle. Um, uh, you know, I went home, cried. Um, 
It was a really tough moment. I had a rare cell type of Hodgkin's lymphoma called NLPHL, uh, nodular lymphatic predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's about 3% of all diagnoses. Uh, basically, it was, it was slow moving, not nearly as aggressive. Um, so I, I had to do I had to do a drip infusion for about six to six to eight hours one day, probably a month and a half ago, uh, and then from there all the rest of my medication was fed in shots through my stomach. Um, but treatment wise, um, it looks like I'm all wrapped up, and uh, I'll do a PET scan probably three and a half, two and a half weeks from now, just to see how much the the cancer's basically destabilized just amazing to hear in his own words everything he's been through and it's a good reminder for people too when they think about no he didn't go through chemo and radiation which a lot of cancer patients understand that that's really where your body gets tore up his he said his quality of life was never affected because he didn't have to do those things but still getting fluids pumped in and out of your body is just insane and to see him out there we're all happy for him definitely answered prayers from his family and for him that he's back on the practice field somebody else who was out on the practice field Traquan Smith and Jameis Winston this is something that I've seen in the last few years where when a drill gets done you'll see a quarterback take a wide receiver off and work with them off to the side I saw that with Jameis Winston and Traquan Smith is that a matter of just getting extra work or is it to prove a point yeah, it's, it's to get extra work. We saw it with Jamal Williams and, and Derek Carr as well. They missed on a couple of connections just in that short passing game. And then Carr pulled them off and they practiced it. And then they hit another one later on. So sometimes, sometimes it's just working out the kinks a little bit. But look, if there are two guys that need to prove a point, it is Jameis Winston <laughs> and it is Traquan Smith. And it was good to see Jameis healthy. Like yeah. he moved well. He didn't look like a, a stiff, injured player no. with a broken back. Like he's bouncing. He's on his feet. He looked limber. He was throwing the ball well. So that was good to see. And, you know, I, I think Traquan Smith does have some stuff to worry about a little bit. I was kind of like really impressed with A.T. Perry at this practice. He caught a back shoulder throw. Uh, I think it was from Jake Hayner at, at one point. Just a really, really good adjustment. And the most impressive thing about it is they missed on it earlier in the practice and then they come back to it and they hit it. So like just that quick progression. And we're going to hear Marcus Colston mm -hmm. talk about him a little bit. There are a couple little maybe similarities to some of the things they do. The next like, Marcus Colston. Not the next Marcus <laughs> Colston, but look, someone yeah, making like, yeah, like a, yeah. being able to adjust to a back yeah. shoulder throw, like that's a that was a Colston staple. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of, they, they had the same OC. So like there's yeah. probably some things about the way they view the game yeah. that are similar. And I, I was impressed with him at this practice. No, yeah, I wasn't. I, I wasn't accusing you of making that comparison. Marcus Colston himself <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> made the comparison is saying he sees a lot of himself in his game because they come from similar roots. But yeah, back to Jameis Winston, the, the very first thing I noticed in practice before they did anything in a team setting and they were in individual position groups. I, I like started recording and put a video up. Uh, they go through all the drills, Carr, Winston, Hayner. What a trio. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a position where hopefully only one of them plays all season. Hopefully Derek Carr takes every snap at quarterback because you know, that will mean good things for the saints, but that is a really good one, two, three. Like, you know, you've got the, the veteran with so much talent in the number two spot now healthy as Nick said, and then no knee and, brace too, by the way. Yeah. So, yeah. And then the, and yeah, moving well on those drills, and uh, and then the rookie developmental guy with with a lot of potential too. I mean, that's that's what you want your room to look like. I I'd have to go through everybody's room in the league, but that I'd have a hard time thinking there's a lot of people that have a, a one two three that you'd want to line up like that. Yeah, I'd still take the one in Kansas City though. You know, oh. so whoever yeah. the two and the three are, <laughs> yeah, you know, know who the two and the three care. are. Just give me one. Yeah, to, to yeah. this quarterback's room uh, advantage. The, the level of comfort that I saw was something that was, I think you should feel good about that. They've already kind of built that chemistry between Carr, Winston and Hayner. The one thing that I noticed and even asked Carr about is Jameis Winston was in his ear the entire practice. Any question Derek Carr had, or if even Jameis Winston didn't even get a question, if he just kind of saw that maybe something was missing there, he was right there to enforce and let him know like, hey, this is how we work in this system. And you guys have to remember, I mean, this is a, a guy who lost the starting quarterback job. And the fact that he has once again humbled himself into putting the team ahead of self speaks volumes to yeah. me. And I think that's only going to help the room as a whole with Hayner learning as well. Yeah, with how pissed he was last yeah. year about his whole entire situation. Every time we went out to practice, he looked incredibly happy. He was being goofy. He was supporting people the way he could. 
And he was kind of like putting himself at service of the team, mm-hmm. shagging balls, doing whatever he could to help out. And you knew inside he was seething, the competitor in him. And when you talked to him, he didn't hide it. He told you how mad he was and how upset he was, but he never allowed it to affect his job, at least as far as we could see, as far as other people tell us about him. And I think you just see that now. I I think that more than anything in the world, Jameis Winston wants to be a starting NFL quarterback. He doesn't have the opportunity. I don't think he's going to allow that to infect this situation. No, yeah. And everybody's always talked about when he first came, right after leaving Tampa Bay and came to be a backup behind Drew Brees. What a teammate he is. What a teammate he is. What a teammate he is. That that is something that has never been in doubt with him. To to his credit, though, like backing up Drew is easy. Backing up Derek Carr is is probably a little bit harder. Backing up Andy Dalton is probably much, much harder than that. So the fact that he can humble himself in this situation, it speaks speaks volumes about his character as a person. And this was just a taste of OTAs. We're going to get into a little bit more at the end of the week, but we're not going to hold you any longer. Let's go ahead and get into this Marcus Colston interview. Joined now by Saints Super Bowl champ, Marcus Colston. Thank you so much for being here with us today. How are things going with you? First and foremost, appreciate you having me. And uh, think, things are going well. We just um, winded down the school year, so get, kind of getting our summer plans together. So, you know, life is busy, but good busy. Busy, busy, busy over here, too. As you know, the Saints just wrapped up day one of OTAs. How closely do you still follow the team? Man, I'm I'm a casual these days, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's funny, man. Life life is just kind of going in so many different directions. And um, my my two little ones, well, my two older little ones are are playing their own sports. So I'm I'm kind of I joke I'm renting my weekends. Uh, they they got me on the road every every weekend, two and three games. So um, I watch when I can. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm a casual these days. So. With that, then, I want to get your thoughts from a wide perspective, then, if you're not there every day and not able to be there. What did you think about Chris Olave and his rookie season and what he can bring in year two? Man, um, he he was super impressive. Uh, just just uh, when you see his, his testing numbers, you figured fi- uh, physically he would come out and, and be able to do some of the things that he was doing. <clears throat> but just watching him play and watching some of the nuance in his game, um, you couldn't have convinced me that he was a rookie. Um, he he just has a feel for the game, a feel for where the soft spots are, a feel for leverage and all of those things that comes with being a veteran receiver uh, that he he was able to come out, out the gate with uh, year one. So I think as impressive as he was in year one, I think he's he's going to continue to ascend in year two and beyond. How important is that feel in particular in, in this offense, just knowing where to sit, when not to sit and all that stuff? I mean, it's everything. It's everything because I mean, as you guys know, opening the NFL is is an angle. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there, there's not there's not you're very seldom going to find you know visible separation. So just kind of knowing uh, and being on the same page, I always look at it as if if you can play the receiver position through the through the eyes of a quarterback, mm. and always kind of be where you feel like the quarterback wants you to be. Um, he kind of has that, like I said, right out the gate. And you you can see it with the different quarterbacks that he played with. Everyone was able to find a level of trust with him really early. And I think that speaks volumes for the way that he sees the game and the way he feels the game. And the team should now have some stability at quarterback with, with getting Derek Carr. How much do you think that will help just the offense overall, just maybe having one guy that they can build around now instead of trying to piece it together every year? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um you know, that's a position where you need stability um, just because you got to be able to build around that that individual strengths. Right. And I think just having having a vision for who that person is and being able to build it out, knowing that that person is going to be there, um, hopefully through more good times and bad. Yeah. Um, it just it just gives you flexibility as an offense. It gives you flexibility as a play caller and it allows you to build that level of trust that you need to operate at a high level, you know, really at, at, at every level of the offense. Marcus, I was looking for you out there at OTAs. I mean, Zach Streif coach for this team. Jari Evans is coaching. Uh, what, next year? No, man. I, I, I actually got my first <laughs> I actually got my first coaching gig lined up um, this fall, as a matter of fact. I'm coaching my, my son's 120-pound team. Oh, so I love, love it. <laughs> so I'll get my feet wet there, and we'll see what happens from there. Well, look, the coach you are very familiar with, uh, as a, you know, Pete Carmichael Jr., um, uh, the whole time you were there in, in different roles, 
uh, and and obviously probably in his most important role yet now without Sean Payton. He he was under fire last year. Um, what what do you think people don't appreciate about how good he is at his job? Well, I think first and foremost, I mean, the man has been there since two thousand six, right? In in a league in a in a an environment where you see coaching carousels ramp up every single year. I mean, he has staying power. And not only does he have staying power, I mean, he's the offense has been a top 10 offense pretty much every year he's been there. So I think um, what Pete brings to the table is, is again, he's, he's a wealth of knowledge. He's been around the best. He's, he's kind of helped groom the best that, that has ever played the game. So, um, you know, I think when you have somebody that, that has that kind of quiet confidence that he has, um, again, you give him a quarterback that you know is, is going to be there and, and the contract and, and everything around Derek Carr says that there's going to be stability in that position. Um, I think it allows somebody like Pete to, to kind of go back into his creative bag. Um, you know, when you have all of those pieces, you have the receiving core looking like it's looking, you got the running back room looking like it's looking, the tight end room, um, you know, has some players that are on the rise. I think when you give Pete all of those pieces and you give him stability, um, that's when he's able to really, um, really shine. And well, I think that's what you'll see. Yeah, stability is the thing this offense has needed more than anything, I think, the last two years, even even when Sean was here. And, and Brooke asked you about Chris Olave. I wanted to ask you about Michael Thomas. How have you watched his career? I mean, obviously, we've made the comparisons a million times. He, he plays a familiar role that you played in this offense. How has it been for you to watch his career and watch someone kind of doing a lot of the same things you did and 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 taking it to the level he took it to? I mean, to to start his career, man, it's been it's been amazing to watch somebody come in and and just take that position to another level. Um, I think that the intensity that he plays with, the the fire and the passion that he plays with, it's infectious. And you know, I think what he brings to that team, what he brings to that locker room, is just a competitive edge like no other. And you know, for the last couple of years, it's been just as a peer, it's been it's been painful to watch him have to go through these these different injuries and in a lot of ways kind of get get crucified by by, you know, some of the some of the fan base in the media because of those injuries. Um, you know, I think. I'm, I'm really rooting for him to come back and have the kind of year that I know he wants to have, um, you know, those injuries start to pile up, especially at that, at, at that position. And, you know, I think for somebody as competitive as he is, he knows, he knows more than anyone else on this earth that he hasn't, mm. pr he hasn't produced at the level that he wants to produce at. Somebody who used to be in those shoes, when you look at what you were able to do, what Jimmy Graham was able to do, Michael Thomas able to do, how would you di differentiate the three of you all? Man, it's, 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 it's splitting hairs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think we all have, we all brought the ability to, to kind of be open when we're not even open. Um, just our, our feel for the game, our body control, and just our ability to create a comfort zone with our quarterbacks. I think we, we all share those similar traits. Um, I think where those two start to separate from me a little bit is just kind of that visible fire. Um, and, you know, I think Mike is, is kind of at the top of the food chain in, in terms of just that competitive spirit. Um, you know, he's somebody that I think the biggest difference b between the three of us is he's, he's got a competitive spirit that really leads the team. Um, and you hear about you hear the stories from practice, you hear how he just raises the level of competition in the building. And I think that's really what makes him really unique. But I mean, you 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 played like a killer too, though. So really what is what is the difference? In quiet, that? quiet still quiet killer. Quiet yeah. silent assassin. It, it, it was it wasn't as visible. <laughs> it wasn't as visible. Um, but no, I I do think that you know, we had some when I was playing, we had some other fiery leaders that kind of led from the front. Led, you heard their voices. You saw you you saw that fire, um, and I was somebody that was a little bit more subdued. Um, but I think with him, you you see it, you feel it, and he's somebody that I, I can imagine. If you walk in the locker room or you walk into the practice facility and you see him work, it automatically has to raise your level. Marcus, I want to take you back to your playing days, even before your playing days, the draft process, getting selected in the seventh round. A lot of guys who fall into that round or late rounds 
kind of go into training camp with a bigger chip on their shoulder, feeling like they have to come out and, and produce day one. Can you tell us what, what your kind of thought process was after the draft coming in? Yeah, I mean, my, my process was was easy. Um, in rookie minicamp, I, I thought for sure I was going to get cut. <laughs> um, we had a three-day minicamp, and I practiced for maybe a half of the first day and and was injured the rest of the time. So um, I came out of rookie minicamp thinking I was going to get cut, came out of OTAs not feeling really good about any chance that I had on making a roster. So coming into training camp, my my, my sole purpose was to survive. Um, you know, so from the day we got, I got the Millsaps, I was in survival mode and it, it was, it was kind of a, it was a blessing in disguise for me just because I wasn't a, I didn't allow myself to see anything else going on around me. So mm -hmm. as the depth chart started moving around and I was oblivious to it, I was just in survival mode for, sh uh, for six weeks straight. Survivor mo mode in more ways than one with Millsaps, just trying to survive <laughs> that heat, I'm sure, and just the grueling schedule you guys had when you were out there. For somebody like A.T. Perry, who fell late, he did. Ha we did see him, you know, not make a couple routine catches. He might be in that same mindset, right? He fell late in the draft. What would be your advice to somebody like him? I mean, just watching him play, and and the the funny connection is his his offensive coordinator there, uh, Warren Majero. Um, was my offensive coordinator at Hofstra my, my oh, wow. few years there. Um, so when I when I would watch AT play, it looked very very familiar. <laughs> similar offense, similar skill set, body build. So what I would tell him is just just be you. Um, you know, I think we take a lot of stock in these draft picks and in these draft positions. At the end of the day, there's there's eighteen hundred people that get to do this, and if you're in the top eighteen hundred people in the world in any industry, like you're doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I would just tell him to be him like the, the, the skill sets that got him there. Um, you know, he's there for a reason and you just got to prove, prove that reason. Right. Well, yeah. Now that I know that lineage, I'm moving AT Perry up on my, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, look, here's the thing I remember most about, about covering you. I, I still don't think all due respect to Jimmy and, and Michael Thomas. I don't think I've ever seen anyone with your catch radius, uh, Low balls, high balls behind you. Um, it, it felt like you could get to them. What's the art to that? What's the art to making the imperfect catch? <laughs> uh, necessity. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think it's it's. I I just had a unique ability to see the the, the world of football very similar to the way that Drew saw it. Um, so a lot of those, a lot of those catches are, are really based on anticipation. Um, and then, you know, a lot of them you're just kind of reacting to and, and that becomes body control. And I was just fortunate. I, I'm, I'm old school. I played a lot of different sports growing up. I, I wasn't one of those kids that specialized. So whether it was gymnastics early on, it was basketball track or, or w whatever it was. I think the mix of just being able to play a bunch of different sports growing up, just building different different layers of hand eye coordination. Um, and then just that combine that with the ability to anticipate and just kind of see it through the quarterback's eyes. I think that's that that combination is what gave me an opportunity to to, to make some of those plays. Um, and you know, all of that is like I said, wrapped in necessity. When you when you're a seventh round pick and and you don't run a, a four three, you got to figure out ways to <laughs> to get open when you're not open. So that was that was my advantage. Do you have one of those that like you're most proud of, or one catch that stands out above above all the others when you think back? There's actually one my rookie year um, in the NFC Championship up in Chicago. Uh, I remember like it was yesterday. It was a, it was that I was playing in the number three position. It was a special scene um, on Brian Erlacher. Okay. And it was one that drew through the back shoulder, and I kind of mistimed my jump. I thought he was going to throw it high, so I kind of went up, and the ball came in low behind the linebacker. So I had to I I literally, I literally jumped. It ended up catching the ball like on on top of my shoelaces. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's one that that I that I, I vividly remember. Wow. And is there like a unscripted moment that you guys came up with just on the fly ever? Like, are there any good stories with, with stuff like that? The chemistry was always crazy between you two. I'm I'm sure there's some stuff we drew in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it was. I always go back to it was it was Lance and myself. Um, Joe Lombardi used to always joke with the young guys. He, he would always talk about 
there's rules guys and there's guidelines guys. Um, so me and Lance were kind of the only guidelines guys. Like here's <laughs> here's the parameters. Whatever works in this box, make it work as long as you make the play. But y'all rookies, by the book. Love it. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, toughest DB you ever faced. You just mentioned Brian Erlacher. Yeah. I forgot this should be toughest defensive player ever because you worked in all sorts of traffic. But but who who gave you the the the, the stiffest challenge? I think. There's very few people that could play at the level of prime Darrell Revis. He was one of those guys. When, when I rate corners, if if you're going to be one of the top guys for me, you got to be able to play every position on the field. And he was one of the guys. He'll he'll follow you all over the field and without help, without safety help. Um, and his size, his size, speed combination was just it was tough to deal with. Well, I am going to ask you to rate a top corner. What's your unique? sort of uh, perspective on Marshawn Lattimore? I think he's he's definitely definitely in that elite group uh, when he's healthy. I think just what he what he's been able to do in that division, uh, specifically the, the the battles with um, Mike Evans, um, <laughs> the battles with, with Julio uh, when he was in when he was in, uh, in Atlanta. Um, I think his he, he's another one that has that really rare size speed strength combination that allows him to play press coverage and um, really get the, the best of a lot of receivers. Uh, so I think he's, he's in that upper echelon, especially when he's healthy. Before we move off the past, we got to ask you, Sean Payton stories, Drew Brees stories. We've all heard them. We've all heard some pretty unique stories. Give us one for each guy. I'll remind you, Sean's in Denver now, so you don't got to <laughs> yeah, protect yeah, him it's anymore. Safe. We're safe here. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's going to see this, right? <laughs> <laughs> Drew, Drew's just, he's an interesting one for me just because he's, it's not really a specific story. It's just the way that he moved around and the way, way that he operated. Mm -hmm. And I always say this, you know, when you, a lot of times when you look at the quarterback position, you just feel corporate and, and you feel like those guys, the way they move around in the locker room, the way that they interact with other teammates, it's just very corporate. Um, but Drew was not that way at all. And I, I recall there was one off season, I think it was a, where we were looking at a lockout. So we were kind of working out outside the facility. Um, and we would go play pickup basketball. And just to see Drew maneuver on the court, it, it was, it, it shouldn't have surprised me because I knew he was a really good <laughs> athlete, but Drew can hoop. Okay. <laughs> Drew, Drew can really hoop. He he's he's like a real point guard out there. He can distribute everything. Um, so that was one of the things that when I saw that, it, it was just kind of it kind of took me back a little bit. He he really can hoop. Um and it was Sean. Sean, Sean and I had an interesting relationship. He was like Parcells, he was just a like a, a button pusher. He would find your buttons, whatever buttons that that triggered you, and he would mash them all at the same time. <laughs> So with, I remember when I, I broke my collarbone coming out of uh, the season opener in Green Bay. Um, in my mind, I'm like, I, I got to get back as fast as possible because this, you know, we had a really good team and this is a contract year. So I'm literally like two weeks out of, out of surgery and I'm trying to get back on the practice field. And Sean is giving me these stories about how Jason Witten broke his jaw, was out playing in a game with his with his jaw wired shut, and, and all I have is a little broken collarbone. <laughs> <laughs> Man, so what is, yeah, he he was a he was just a, a supreme button pusher. What Jeez. what does that pressure do for for a team when you have a, a coach like that that's just constantly applying it? And I'm sure there's a fine line that he's got to walk too with that. But like, what does it do for a team just to know that that he's on it like that? I think you just want you want an environment that's competitive at all at all times. And I think that's what he brought, that's what he brought, you know, to our practices, to our meetings, to really everything that we did, you know. So we had Drew on one side who was ultra competitive. For a lot of times we had JV on the defensive side, ultra competitive. And most of the time he was a referee. Yeah. <laughs> just kind of riling up either side. Um, so he was he was just somebody that you knew when you stepped in the building, you knew what time it was. You know you had to be on your game, you had to be ready to compete every day. And I think in this industry, you know, that's all you can ask for is is a coach, an organization, a team that's just built on competition and wants to be the best. And there's some coaches that take like a opposite approach that are more player friendly in that like when a coach, I know you were with Sean the whole time, but like if a coach were like that, 
Where does that competitive edge maybe come from if, if the coach isn't the one, you know, pushing that button every single day? It, it boils down to knowing your locker room, right? And I think Sean, Sean was, he, he knew the guys that he had. He knew the guys that he brought in was kind of a certain makeup. Um, and I think where, where you see some coaches that it, it maybe starts to go off the rails is they're not really in tune with what their team needs mm-hmm. at that moment. And, you know, I think to be a head coach, you've kind of got to be a chameleon and really adapt to the situation. And, you know, I think some of these coaches come in and this is my persona. This is what it's going to be. And everybody else is going to adapt. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of grown men in that locker room. Yeah. You know, so the just the ability to adapt to the situation, I think, is what, what made Sean special and what I see a lot of these these head coaches struggle with. Marcus, I wasn't out here when you played came in 2019 have been covering the team since one of the things these two guys have mentioned, listen, not every player loved doing media. We say it. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think I would have loved being interviewed. I like being the one on the other end. Was there maybe like some rough waters that happened in the past or what was the deal there? No, I mean, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> we, had to, ask, we I, had to ask you, we had to ask you. No, it's funny because I've I've spoken to you guys probably more in retirement than I did when I was. <laughs> yeah. I never told them that before. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm I'm just somebody that um, one I'm just I'm about as extreme in it, of an introvert as you're gonna meet. Yeah. Right. And- so I choose my words very very selectively. Yes. Um, and with that, you guys know it is it's nothing. It was never anything personal. It was just like how many times can I say the same thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't just keep repackaging the same company line. Right. Right. So I'm not gonna waste my time. I'm not gonna waste y'all's time. And that's kind of how how the relationship with the media just just kind of fizzled away over the years. It was just like I can't really answer. I can't give you real answers. Right. We're going to keep asking the same question in kind of different ways. <laughs> so let's stop playing the games. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and honestly, with that, I think, you know, you reminded me of Michael Thomas in that. I think that might be our relationship with him right now. And you can speak to this, Marcus. You know Michael Thomas better than we do. We know him from a media perspective. Is that maybe why when you see media or fans getting frustrated with his interviews, is it maybe just more of that, that he is more introverted and doesn't want to keep being asked the same stuff? Is that what it comes to with some of the athletes? I, I think I think a lot. It has to do. I think it ties into a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, some people are some people see this as. When I get out of the game, I'm going to I'm going to jump to the other side. I'm going to be in front of the camera. Other people. You know, it, it becomes kind of one of those things that, that you have to do as part of the job, right? And we we all understand the business aspect of it, but at the end of the day, I'm here to to play. Mm-hmm. I'm here to prepare and perform at the highest level. I, I and, and I'm about doing the work. I don't want to talk about doing the work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think I think you can see a lot of that in him. He just he wants to go to work and he wants to he wants to produce. And anything that is that feels counter to that, mm. it, which talking about doing the work feels counter to that, you, you just you just don't really want to entertain it. You just want to go do the work. You told us no way nicer than he does, though, for the record. You were all. <laughs> 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 but uh, the thing that's fascinated me about you is just kind of watching your transition in, in the post career. It seems like everything was was very deliberate with with kind of how you moved into it, at least from the outside looking in. When did you kind of start planning? OK, I'm going to go into business. I'm going to do all this stuff post career. Yeah, a lot of it, a lot of the groundwork I, I laid when I was still playing. Um, you guys might not know this, but. I want to say starting in like 2012, um, I was actually running a, a football organization in my off seasons. Okay. So I would play in New Orleans down in the fall and then fly home, you know, in the spring and, and you know, pick up sponsorships and marketing and, and sales and ticket sales and all that kind of stuff for the arena team that I was running. So oh, wow. um, that was really my, my entry point in the business, like, I started earlier than that. I started angel investing and stuff like that, but it was a little bit more passive. But when I, when I dove into the ownership and and operations of of that football team, that was kind of like my MBA on the fly because I got, 
I got kind of thrown in the fire in a bunch of different areas. And that's what really sparked for me. That's what really sparked my interest in business and just the ability to take the things that I was doing on the field and more, more so the preparation and the mindset that it took to get ready. Um, I saw how transferable that stuff was to everything that I was doing off the field. And that's when I started to realize that one, I can do two things at one time. Mm. Right? <laughs> I don't, I don't need to be football 24, seven, 365 I actually enjoyed the mental break from preparing to play. Um, so when I saw that the skill sets were transferable, one, and two, that doing other things gave me the opportunity to actually miss playing football, hmm. um, that's when I just dove in 110% and I've been I've been in it ever since. Did you did you always know that you wanted to to be in business? Like if you know football hadn't worked out in in 06, is that like is that the path or did that come a little bit later? It, it kind of came a little bit later. Um, I knew that that I wanted to do other things. I've always known that I was kind of a tech nerd. Um, so that's kind of why you saw my, my start fall into technology. Um, very few people know that I actually went to Hofstra as an engineering major. Um, that didn't last long when I started playing. But <laughs> um, yeah, I, I knew that there was always going to be something, something else. And when I got a chance to get started on that something else early on, more than anything, it allowed me to just check the boxes of the things that I didn't want to do. And, you know, I think when you have the opportunity to to kind of test the waters and, and figure out what, what resonates and what doesn't, it makes it a little bit easier um, of a transition because it's not like you're falling off a cliff when you're done playing. You're just kind of testing and you're almost in beta testing mode in, in a lot of ways. And that's kind of how I saw it. Then becoming a professor at UNO, how did that all come about? And do you like that role? Man, for, for an introvert, I, I love it. I have okay. no idea what. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was one of those things where um, they invited me in to speak uh, to some of their entrepreneurship students. Um, and that talk just kind of led into them asking me to come back and, and deliver the, the commencement keynote. Um, and then that turned into hey, would you want to come in and teach in our in our honors program? Would you want to come in and teach a, a course on entrepreneurship and leadership? And for me, it was just a, it was an opportunity to try something new. Mm -hmm. um, it was very uncomfortable for me and that's exactly why I did it. But yeah, it was it was just an opportunity to, to take some of the things that I had learned, a lot of the things that I had learned just from a bunch of different um, business opportunities and and just to, to pour into some some undergrad students and um, the crazy thing is I, 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 I kind of built the curriculum from scratch, right? So I had my whole lesson plan that I, I came into it feeling good about my whole 16 weeks and week two, I figured out I had to tear it all up. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it was, it was, it was really cool. Just kind of figuring that out on the fly. And I think what that allowed for the students to get out of it was a more tailored approach. Mm -hmm. Right. It was kind of built around the things that they wanted to learn about. And um, I was just able to tap into a, to a pretty wide and, and diverse base of, of of different business experiences. And I think it, it made it a meaningful experience for the for the students. And obviously, for me, it was um, it was just a, an opportunity to try something new. So there's roles, professors and guidelines, professors. And if you got to tear it up, you just, <laughs> there you go. There you go. I came in with rules and left with guidelines. <laughs> Well, Marcus, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us on the show. I appreciate you guys having me any, anytime.